Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. You can turn to Proverbs chapter 15. I don't know if you've ever had the joy or opportunity to watch two people argue and they're arguing past each other. You know, one, I'll just give you a made up instance. You know, apples are red. No, oranges are orange. And they, they're arguing back and forth and they argue past each other. We, we look at that and say, oh, there's a real problem there's a real failure to communicate in our present age we have such access to means of communication there's you don't even have to put much effort to communicate and I honestly believe a lot of people put very little effort in communication uh, you, you read social media and you, it's just, it can be really ugly. And the one thing that our incredible access to devices of communication shows is there's a huge lack of wisdom when it comes to communication. One of my favorite chapters in the book of Proverbs is chapter 15. And the first five verses of Chapter 15 really deal with communication. And they, they give genuine wisdom, as we would expect from the scripture, on how we should guide our, our words and how we should guide our life in communication. Let's go to Lord in word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to it and get wisdom and guidance. We can be saved from so much trouble and difficulty in life just by following the wisdom that is there. You're a gracious and loving God and you want what is best for us. And as we look into your word, let us follow it and glean the wisdom that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, when we first read it, it, it sounds like uh, there's something very easy to miss here, but let's go and read verse 1. It says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Now, it's a fairly straightforward verse, but there's a lot of things that are very easy to miss when we first jump into that verse. Uh, obviously, we've seen instances where people have gotten in heated arguments and we can see the harsh words and the grievous words, and we say, okay, I, I need to have soft words. I need to, have, and we'll talk about what soft words actually mean in a moment. But there's something that's very easy to miss when we first jump into this. And there's an assumption in verse 1 that is very important for our biblical communication. If we're going to be righteous and wise in the way we communicate, Something that is just very evident in there but very easy to pass over is the fact that it comes off a soft answer. There's an assumption that the Bible comes with when it comes to speaking, and that is that we use our ears before we use our mouth. One of the keys in communication is listening. There's a lot of people that hear. There's a lot of things to hear. Noise I think that is one of the things with our, our media today. Noise becomes a background. Muffy, because uh, me being away at night, she likes to have the TV on where there's noise. That sort of drowns out any other noises that might wake her up. Uh, I'll guarantee you when she's asleep, even though the TV is on, she's not listening. The sounds are bouncing off of her ears. There's a lot of people that have sounds bounce off their ears and never enter into their brain. One of the assumptions with righteous and wise communication is that we listen. That is something that is the basis of this. So a soft answer 
So an answer we've heard. It's an assumption of listening going on here. Now what is a soft answer? When, I, when we come across certain words in the Bible, it's easy to take it the wrong direction. A soft answer is not a weak or a timid answer. It's not an answer that it sort of half, deals in half-truths. I think that is one of the dangers that can be had when we are Christians is an effort to be overly gentle. And in an effort to do that, instead of being kind, we're nice. We won't speak the truth. We won't speak the truth in love. We'll say platitudes or uh, ideas and we'll, we'll peddle in truths to make, you know, the white lies to make someone feel good. That is not a soft answer. That is an answer that would be, God would consider ungodly. By the way, we don't have to, and we'll, I'll mention this more further, we don't have to say everything that is true. This is an important thing to understand. Everything that we say must be true, but we don't need to speak all truth. That is something that is not a requirement. Sometimes we need to not say things. Uh, sometimes being silent is the best answer. But a soft answer turns away wrath. When I think of something that is soft, uh, and Steve can relate to this. I remember wrestling, and uh, actually the wrestling coach that I had the opportunity to wrestle under down at Pensacola was a St. Cloud graduate. Him and his twin brother, if you ever go up to the St. Cloud University in the Hall of Fame, uh, there in St. Cloud, him and his brother are, they have their pictures and their name up there. They wrestled in the Olympics. Amazing, amazing men and amazing wrestlers. But they came to the college and they were both doing a demonstration for the whole school when uh, both our team and his brother's team matched up. And one of the things that stuck with me is when they were demonstrating the wrestling mats for the people that aren't, weren't used to wrestling is you took out an egg. Now if I took an egg out and I threw it as high as I could in the air without hitting the ceiling, it would come down splat, wouldn't it? No matter how high you wanted to throw the egg, when you had that wrestling mat underneath it, it would bounce and not crack. Now, if that wrestling mat would have just been soft, it would have been useless. You know, a, a feather pillow is really soft, you know, a, a down pillow. But, you know, I'm guessing if you throw an egg far enough, it's, you have a down pillow, it's going to go through there and crack. Uh, if those wrestling mats were just soft, they would be almost impossible to wrestle on. They were something incredibly strong and firm, yet they kept something from breaking. Something with our soft answers, again, it needs to be true, but there needs to be not deliberately harsh. You know, I, I think one of the problems that we can have in Christianity and in people that love the truth, by the way, not all people that have a love for the truth, have come to the knowledge of all the truth, but sometimes we can deal with it in a harsh way that turns people away from the truth. So a soft answer is something that's firm. It's not timid, it's not weak. It's something honest, it's something truthful. But a soft answer, it says here, turns away wrath. You know, if I'm not deliberately trying to stir something up, if I'm not being insulting, if I'm not being injurious with my words, uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to turn away wrath. Uh, there's the story of Gideon in the book of Judges when he went out and he had fought a battle and one of the tribes of Israel came to him and said, you didn't let us know you were going to do this. And they engaged in the latter part of the Bible, uh, the battle, and Gideon goes, you know, you guys did great here. You, you did wonderful. You surpassed what we did. He exhibited wisdom. He could have insulted or taken it as a personal offense. 
soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh words or grievous words stir up anger. A lot of times if somebody says something to us and it's hurtful, we want to return that hurt, don't we? Like, oh, you think that you want to insult me this way? I'm going to send it back your way. And just like somebody in a rock fight, they start throwing rocks at you, and you want to pick them up and throw them back. You know, by the way, when you throw rocks back, you're just rearming your enemy. Harsh words stir up anger. Now, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 give us some hows. How do we do it? What does it look like? Some of the things that we should think about if we're going to be people that answer properly. Verse 2, it says, The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but mouths of fools pour out folly. What is a soft answer? Soft answer is one that is knowledgeable. Someone that is wise, and this is, this is the word here, commends, has the idea of supplies. One of the things that we as believers should be is suppliers of knowledge. Doesn't mean we need to know everything, but we need to know God's word. And by the way, if we don't know something, we need to be careful about thinking we have to. You know, a good answer, if somebody comes to you with a problem, you don't know the answer, is, I don't know. Sometimes we may need to go search that out. We may need to ask someone else. We may need to go to the Lord, go to the Word and go to the Lord in prayer. But a wise person supplies knowledge. A soft answer is going to be a knowledgeable answer. What's interesting is the comparison, and each one of these do have comparisons here. But the mouths of fools pour out folly. The idea of folly in the scripture is this disconnect from God and a uh, pushing towards sinfulness. Again, as we see our society and we look back on it and look out there, there are so many people that their mouths are just pouring out words and it's so full of foolishness. Wisdom will mean sometimes we don't say anything or at least we do not pretend to know we know something. Verse 3 reminds us of something as well. What is going to guard our speech and guard our answers? It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now, this can almost sound ominous, but it's something that we need to remember. God is listening. God sees what we say. His eyes are all over everything. There's sometimes, even if we whisper, God is hearing that. God knows what we're saying, and we live in respect to the Lord. I'll guarantee you, if we guide our mouth by the idea that God is listening to what we say, there's going to be words that do not come out of our mouth. There is an accountability that all people have before the Lord. And even the smallest word spoken in vain, God knows about. Verse 4, and this gives us more of an idea of what this tongue should look like. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. What is the purpose of our speech? When I speak to somebody, my goal should be to edify them. Sometimes people need encouragement, sometimes they need direction. As a wise person, I, my mouth is going to enrich people. It is going to feed people. It is going to strengthen people. I have an accountability for my mouth to use my words to benefit other people. Look at the second part of verse 4 here. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. This is something that we need to remember as well. How easy it is to destroy somebody with the, the smallest words. We've all heard that saying, sticks and stones may break my, or sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know, there's sometimes 
You'd rather get hit in the head with a rock or slapped in the side with a stick than some of the harsh words that people can say. People can be destroyed with words, whether it's gossip or harsh criticism, unkindness. This idea of perverseness is twisted words, words that do not fit with God's purpose. Gentle tongue is a tree of life. Do my words feed people? Or do they hurt people? Now, in verse 5, we come to the very end of this section in Proverbs 15. And it, where we started with is answer. Okay? Uh, what's the first place that we start in communication? We start by listening. Look what it says here in verse 5. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. Good communication starts and ends with listening. When it says here, a fool despises his father's instruction. Now, there's two ways. Immediately, if we see this, we think of somebody that despises, ah, you know, what you just said doesn't make any, any sense, and cast it out. Now, as we look in Proverbs, a father here is being indicative of someone that is seeking after, someone that is a godly father that has studied life and is going to give direction for the benefit of the child. A fool, when they hear direction from someone that has benefit for them, discounts it. But there's an even greater way to despise instruction. That is not even getting it. It's not worth my time. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm just going to put my fingers in my ear and go, nah, 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 nah. I'm not going to listen to instruction. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to come up with my things my own way. A fool despises, counts instruction as little worth. I can think of individuals that have went through pain, struggles, and sorrows, and it's like, you know, you really didn't have to. Individuals could have given you direction to save you that suffering. You know, one of the things, it's easy when, when you get something out, you're going to go, okay, I'm going to assemble this. I don't need instructions. And you start putting it together and you go, oh, I wish I would have read the uh, destructions. <laughs> Sometimes they're destructions. If we're from Ikea, it's destructions. But you end up, have you ever put those things together with the stupid little Allen wrenches? And you get everything put together and you're going, oh, this is backwards. And then you have to take all those out and you're like, oh, I wish I would have read the instructions better. We need instruction. One of the things that is about the human nature God has created us for instruction. Even before, before the fall of man, human beings needed revelation. There's things that we're not going to know without instruction. There's things that just common sense are going to seem, seem the right way. But God will give us direction that is true. We need instruction. But whoever heeds reproof is prudent. It's interesting. In the beginning, we started with the positive and ended with the negative. Here, we start with the negative, despising instruction. But the, the second part here, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. Reproof is the idea, hey, don't do that. It's, it's hard to hear reproof. Anybody here like criticism? <laughs> it's not fun, is it? To say you're doing something wrong, no matter how gently somebody comes to it, strikes against our very human nature. I don't want to hear I'm not doing it right. I'm not going the right direction. What I'm thinking about something is wrong. I don't want to hear reproof. That is something endemic to mankind. It's not comfortable having somebody say, you're wrong. In fact, it's hard to even say, I'm wrong. And, you know, oh, yeah, I was wrong. 
That is a difficult thing. And if you can get to the point in your life where when you are wrong, you can admit it, that's a big step of spiritual maturity. Whoever heeds reproof is prudent. Wise people are people, aren't people that do not make mistakes. A little double negative here, does that make sense? Wise people still make mistakes. That might be a little clearer way of saying it. You're still going to goof up. By the way, there's two classifications here that we need to remember that we need reproof in. Sometimes it's sinful things. And we can sin knowingly or accidentally. There can be something that's sinful and we didn't realize it because of lack of knowledge. But there's things that are sinful that we need to be reproved of or corrected on. Sometimes there's things that are just mistakes. There's nothing ill. It's nothing morally bad about it. But, hey, there's a mistake. Uh, For example, we could play one of the videos when the guy drove underneath the, the awning out there, that was a mistake. Most likely there was no moral ill intent by driving in, hey, I'm going to hit this church's uh, you know, breezeway here. That's a mistake. And there's things that we need to be reproved for. You know, if we're going to be wise, we're going to be reproved. We need to be ready to hear that. So what does good communication begin with? It begins with listening. And again, listening isn't just hearing, okay? It bounced off my ears. Okay, are you done speaking? You done talking? Okay, now I'm going to tell you everything I have. And I'm going to unload on you. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. There's some, by the way, there's some people that have given so many people a piece of their mind, they don't have any mind left. A soft answer turns away wrath. We need to listen. And we need to listen not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the other person. We need not just speak for our benefit. We need to speak for the benefit of someone else. Is your speech wise? Have you mastered answering softly? Not weakly, not weakly, weakly, however you'd say that. Not timidly, but softly. In the way God that has us answer, truthfully, firmly, and for the benefit of the other person. Let's go and close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, speech is something that we engage in on a regular basis. But we can so often do it so poorly. That is because our speech is connected to our heart, and oftentimes our heart leads us astray. Let us be wise, let us be blessed, and let us be a blessing with our speech. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.